talk today, some notions of AI assistive software development. Uh, many of us here have been going down this road over the past few months here at Austin Link Chain. Uh, I'd like to use uh, this space right now to kind of explore how each of you are seeing uh, your software development uh, methodologies change, your viewpoints on uh, how AI assisted uh, coding may be changing your world, and oh, maybe bring it into some automated testing and debugging space. That is interesting. And then the project management the workflow, maybe we can talk about the features. Uh, for the start, let's kick it off. Uh, Rob, can you give just a, like, a short brief about what you do, what your focus is, and each of you, what you do, what your focus is, and you know, what is your top of mind about the subject of AI software development? Yeah, cool. So Rob Kessler, I would consider myself sort of a split brain. I'm, I'm half finance, half uh, AI. And basically, I'm trying to use AI and all, everything technology to uh, basically reinvent the Wall Street analysts, which is what I've been for a couple decades. So I want to basically admit my replacement before I retire. And so in terms of uh, using AI in the development workflow itself, which is sort of the meta uh, concept, I guess, in some respects, I think of it like a new employee. You know, I've had small teams of developers, and I've always found that uh, the better that I scope a task and explain what needs to be done, the, the quicker I get back a solution that conforms to that expectation. If I'm too fast and too varied in how I have my instructions for what I need from the team or what I'm expecting, then I get back kind of a garbage answer. And I find the same is often true with these elements, elements tools and whatever we're using, whether it's a copilot with Git, GitHub, or whether it's uh, Claude Dev. Uh, as long as I am explicit about what I'm, what I'm asking, good, good response is. And um, so in some respects, I think that's transferable going from the sort of human aspect to the virtual. Jackson, I want to give a little, a little background about where you're coming from on this and uh, your initial insights with these AI code tools. Yeah, so like I said earlier, I'm a software engineer, full we'll stack software developer. And I mean, when, like when ChatGPT first got launched, it was kind of this like revelation. Just like, oh, okay, this can help me probably twice as effectively as any Google search ever could. And that kind of just from there just kept growing on top of itself. Obviously, the tools like GitHub Copilot, I think, was another nice, easy integration. And now Call It Dev is kind of taking that up a notch. So for me, it's just about efficiency gains. Uh, and I kind of apply that to my personal life as well. So anywhere I can. You know, just get an extra 30 seconds of my day back. I feel like I try to use it for that. Uh, Claude Dev is a, a good example, even today, where, you know, if you're doing something, building something end to end, you're going to just tweak a store procedure over here, build out, you know, screen on the other end of things. Hey, why don't you just pass this task off over to Claude Dev, let it handle the small, mundane task that it needs to do. But obviously, you're seeing it on the other end of the spectrum where you can get from point, you know, get to point A, like you saw what Cam was doing with the GUI interfaces, very quickly. So like, I don't think it's, it's I think it's also going to replace some low code solutions. That's the things that we talked about too, where going from drag and drop solutions, being able to replace those with legitimate code and see that code, and then being able to modify it to what you need. So I think there's a lot of possibilities that are endless, and I think, it, you know, there's the short term, there's the intermediate term, there's the long term, and I don't feel like I can confidently forecast anything after the end of 2024. So. I feel it. Brian, what about you? Yeah, so over the past eight years, I've been running an internal application, web hosted application that enables our sales team, marketing team, non technical people to, to better demo and, and demonstrate our product to our customers without having to manage it on their local system or anything like that. So we've had a very small group of team, we're a small team, there's four of us, one technical lead, the rest are developers. We all wear multiple hats. We should be a team of at least 10 engineers, um, but we're not. And so we've, with that, we've always had to work very efficiently, try out the methodologies, plug and play different styles of doing stuff, be as efficient as we can with all of our, with all of our meetings, our time, things like that, planning. Everybody wears multiple hats, comes in, does, does what needs to be done. And so from a software development standpoint, that's usually where I'm coming from. As a full stack engineer, having to figure out how to fix problems across multiple technologies. So that's actually a, a great segue to fixing problems against, uh, across multiple technologies. 
um, and generated across multiple technologies. Uh, I think uh, in an earlier presentation, we, we saw mention that you know, PodDev to, in this case, one AI in the tool, to generate, to hack together an SL front end interface. Where in your experience or in your viewpoint are you seeing your, your AI, whether it be an accelerated IDE plugin or an external component, um, where are you seeing that fit in your workflow, like expanding the workflow of what you're able to code? For me, two things seem to define the success, if I had to summarize it for, for what I've seen. One is the brain. Uh, so what it's been trained on, and best I can tell, you know, plot sign at 3.5, the more mainstream the, the code that you're using, uh, the better chance it is it kind of understands without having to feed a whole lot of specificity. So as an example, something like GUI based React, very big element, or, or your base library Python, you know, I mean, it's going to know what you're talking about pretty easy. The further I get into nuanced code or vendor specific implementations of things, the more it's going to start getting stuck in loops just because it doesn't understand the context. And I'm going to have to almost pretty much do it myself at the end of the day. And I, I find myself having to check myself on that because sometimes I'll get lazy. I'm like, oh, this is something I don't want to have to look up because it's so you know nuanced that I don't care to remember it. I want to rely on this AI to solve that for it. That's exactly the kind of thing I want to use it for, right? And so I just lazily throw it in there and it doesn't work, and I try to force it to do it again, and then finally I learn what it's doing, and I go through line by line, and I'm like, oh, it's stuck in a stupid loop because it really doesn't understand the syntax here. You gotta go to the docs, look it up, the old school way, right? So, the brain, right? What does the brain know? What has it been trained on? The other thing that for me defines success is the context. So, if you've got a big code repository, first of all, it's good to break it down into modularized, smaller files. That's generally in most implementations of the code practice anyway, right? But even then, you might have a, a large code base that's pretty heavily nested in file structures. And with that, I find it's not natively the best at being able to transverse that. Now, a, a colleague of ours, Baskin, has, has uh, taken an initiative in that space and uh, designed a little add-in where you can basically, with every prompt on the back end, give Claude Dev a little bit structure of the project, both what you're trying to accomplish and where to find things. I think that's a, that's a great sort of add-in. So kudos to Baskin for doing that. And then in addition, the native Claude Dev capability, you can do a little at symbol and like specifically reference files. So for today, for example, I knew I had a pretty complicated structure and I, I didn't want it to go off on tangent and modify a bunch of different files. I knew exactly which four or five files I wanted to work with. They were in different folders. I said, use this file for this context. I want you to consider this, that, and that. And it gets it done in the first prompt. So a few extra minutes making sure I point out exactly what context I wanted to use, uh, understand where the brain has been trained, and I think for me those are the two key aspects. I mean, just back to just working in small efficiency games. So like working in larger code bases, like a lot of can get hung up on some things. It's kind of hard to get it to do exactly what you want if you're pretty far along in a project. Some of the business logic is pretty pretty deep. It doesn't do great at handling those things. So I think, and, and, and honestly, I can program that out quicker than I can figure out how to prompt and get it to do the thing I want to do anyways. But then there's certain things where today I had like a where clause that wasn't even that complicated. It was like multi-level, but it was something that more or less I just didn't want to have to think through. So I just let it do that thing. I'm going to grab a cup of coffee, I'm back, here it is. And so there's small things like that. And part of it is this, I think laziness of having to get super verbose about what it is that I want it to touch, what I want it to do, and, and, and at that point, it's kind of the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean, I might as well just write it at this point. So I do think it's going to get to a point, and maybe it's by the end of the year, maybe it's by the end of next year, but I think it's right there where you don't have to say too much and it's going to pick it up. So, so I'll, I'll go a little bit different direction. One of the, one of the first more powerful use cases that I ran into um, was more by accident than anything. Uh, me and my team were sitting through doing a planning session for a feature of our next scrum. And we were going back and forth like you normally do on hashing out could it be better, right? A Linux um, daemon for the feature we were building, or would, would a script be better to handle what we were doing? And there was a lot of back and forth, no clear answers. And my team lead, he gets all the credit on this one, I didn't think of it. 
he just pulled up ChatGPT, and this was this was about a year ago. And so he, he pulled up ChatGPT and basically asked, hey, how do I write a daemon to blah, 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 blah. And it spit out a set of code to write a daemon. And he was like, okay. Then he turned around and said, how do I write a script to do the exact same thing? And it spit out a script. And instantly, everybody in the meeting can all look at the script, can all look at the code on the screen, and instantly know what's more complex, what are we looking at, what are we facing? And then it accelerated the conversation into, if we go the daemon route, we didn't consider this, 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 and this, but the code pointed it out. We didn't need the code to write anything for us. We didn't need it to work. It was just pseudo code. And it got everybody on the same page instantly. We all came out of that one pretty shocked with what just happened, but then that instantly got integrated into all of our meetings, all of our planning sessions, all of our scrums. When we have to sit down and we have to either design something or figure something out, let that do the, the heavy lifting. Let it do 80% of the work, spit it out, dump it in the Jira tip and move on. And then we can write on top of that. And it, it accelerated a lot of our planning work by doing that. You know, it's really interesting they bring up the, the acceleration of the AI agent as a, as a third or fourth team member to be able to um, rapidly iterate and visualize on the structure of something Indeed. Expanding on that, you know, kind of the next step past that is often like automated testing and debugging, right? And, and, and kind of getting that feedback, that feedback loop in that cycle. Let me see. Can you, in, in I'll, I'll start with Brian on this because he kind of gone over this a little bit. But can you share either some time, some 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 examples of how how um, automating that feedback loop and that, that feedback cycle for debugging either within a ID plugin like Claude Dev or external in your code, where you see that adding value in any place that you see the value so far? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think when you can have the agents who can actually analyze what type of output you're getting and be able to react to it or turn around and, and make additional steps to correct what's wrong, we, we already see that with, with these with these flows and with these agent interactions. And and so if, if you can have a developer who can actually write the code, it can even be an agent. Write the code, write the test, and then have a test agent who actually executes the test and sends feedback back. Um, that can also be done within the PR process. When, when code gets checked in, PR gets pushed for review, you can take and have an AI agent or in, inside the workflow review and say, okay, if, if you were to write this code, what test would you write with it? Have it double check and it's picking up all the use cases of the code. Is it pinpoint enough for unit test, integration test, end to end test, whatever? And so adding that in there gives them an extra layer of just visibility into are we doing this the right way? But then also going further into allowing the agents and the AI to do that stuff for you. So if one of them can say, yes, you need to do these four things, the next one can actually pick it up and attempt to execute it and make it happen and then provide a feedback loop back and forth through the chain to do that. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I've used it the old school way just for eight years of method. Go ahead and write like an X unit and unit type of unit test for your for unit method. But I haven't done anything too extensive when it comes to testing. I, I do think that there's other ways, like you mentioned, um, using it as like a separate team member. We're on some super small teams where I work, so there's sometimes you get not the best requirements, or not the best documentation, whatever it is. So. This is another way to continue with that. I think being able to save yourself time through writing mundane unit tests and then also on the back end be able to have it create documentation and stuff like that. I think there's plenty of space all around a project that you could go ahead and you know, build out a fully fledged team if you don't really have one. Bro? I haven't dealt with extensively in using documentation and testing. Part of it's a trust issue and I just need to get over that hurdle. Some of it is depending on the project I'm working on. Some of my internal stuff, documentation is sourced. Uh, and stuff for clients, I'm very focused on the documentation and I don't get to pass that. But that's just me. Okay, and last round, and we'll definitely open up to the audience. So, let's do the combination. Where do you see, uh, let's explore how the AI and AI software development interact with the project management side. Right, so creating tickets, creating PRs, uh, coming into the existing workflow. And Brian touched on integration of agents into like, pipelines. Do you see uh, other areas in, in, with your experience, with, with, with your exploration into these AI tools, are you starting to see opportunities for this to fit into 
kind of the, the non-functional requirements of, of a day-to-day -day developer? I, I was going to say absolutely yes. Kind of the, the first story that I told, um, I think that's a, that's a, a key point. Um, the, everything that happened in the planning was all a PM style function. And so I, I think you, you have this gap between engineering teams and product teams. And a lot of times it seems like product teams just writing something and throwing it over the fence and saying good luck. But where can they add value? The, the product teams can't necessarily sit down and write a ton of code. So if they can leverage AI and they can leverage, uh, leverage agents and workflows to build up either like a simple proof of concept or even build out pseudo code that can help showcase for the engineers what they need make it clearer or even a starting point better than you know a bullet point and as a as an end user I want to be able to run you know that type of stuff and so I, I really think it adds a lot of value there and if the PMs can actually get a good starting point started for the engineers that allows them to move a lot faster and a lot more accurate. Uh, yeah I think I Colin we talked about Vizier.dev that was like a good example of that where sometimes you're forced to just come up with UI <laughs> on your own and I'm not somebody that's really good at just brainstorming where things should sit on a screen. Uh, so if you leave it to me, it probably doesn't come out the best looking thing, but having a good starting point with something like vzero.dev that gives you UI mock-up at a minimum and some ideas uh, that you can work off of, and then sometimes it's trying to figure out how to architect a solution, figuring out the best way to go about something. It can be small, like, you know, maybe it's a do get package, going back to our .NET conversation earlier. So it's like, well, why would I use one thing versus another? And be able to have something that you could ask questions off of and have more of a conversation versus perusing the Microsoft docs, which probably ends up inevitable at some point or another, but prefer to skirt that if I can. And, and so I think there's plenty of space too around, and I, I think our, my company can in particular do it a lot better, but finding ways to just automate some of these things that whether it's handling of tickets, building requirements, gathering requirements, documentation, I think all that stuff can be heavily automated in, in a lot of ways. And, and even doing stuff like what Cam and I are working on, building those types of components into that workflow. So in RFPs, I mean, it, it really goes all the way up the ladder. My friend said over here, we, we were talking about in the car not too long ago, where if you, this is getting a little, a little ahead of things, but if you walk Claude Dev, 10 steps down the road, what is that going to really look like? And, you know, if this thing's already coding things out for you, like, where does the developer sit? And it sounded like, you know, you kind of made a joke, like, well, what are you going to be doing? And it's like, well, it might be the other question, where it's like, you have to be just technical enough to know what questions to ask and where you're going to sit in the middle of things. So there's a lot of workflow things that I think over the next two years are going to really, not really sure where they're going to lead, honestly, but uh, that's kind of at least some inevitable that it's possible. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's huge on the front end. I mean, on the planning stage, uh, concept selection, ideation. Uh, a lot of my projects, I want to take all the stuff that is not really proprietary. I want to use the most mainstream, well-supported uh, solution possible. And what better way to do that than to query the AI that used to offload it and plot dev, right? So if I can ask it some early prototyping questions, and it seems like it pretty quickly mock up a solution that looks very logical, well-supported, not too cumbersome, convoluted. Okay, that might be the same concept to run with. And that's real rapid, a lot, a lot faster than, than I've done in the past with humans, right? Where, okay, all right, who's gonna, for the next you know couple of days, you're gonna look into this, you're gonna look into that, let's reconvene and see you know, where we think we wanna head with this. Now it's like a matter of 15 minutes with chat to the team. So one of the one of the things I'm kicking around, I, I got ideas about from last month goes into this, and I, I see this this futuristic view. So we saw last month where we could take audio transcripts and we could really pull out key components of it, um, measure what what were key conversations, what were key topics, things like that. So you take that one step further. If if you're looking at building a product or a feature or whatever it is, you're taking take your app in a different direction. You pull all the great minds into one room and everybody starts hashing it out. And the problem is, is we get this very flat, very condensed notes or transcript of the meeting that, that everybody has to take action out of. And what ha actually happens in the meetings is people actually go through architectural walkthroughs. They, they discuss what's happening, they discuss how we build this, and even sometimes it goes further where there's conflict and there's three or four different approaches to take. 
So if we can take it to the point where we can take the audio transcript, translate it and filter it down into a code generation tool, by the time everybody walks out of that meeting and gets back to their desk, there's three AI mock-up tools with all the different discussions happening that shows the different approaches. That can be measurable. You can actually hit, click a button and see output and see what works, what doesn't. And so be able to take what we're talking about and have it actually build it for us while we're going. I think that technology is there now. Now to ship it straight to production, I don't think so. But if we can get 50% of the way there now, that's way better than we were before. You know, the 50% the of the way there rings true to me, uh, especially in the spirit of learning the open and showing how we're broken stuff to each other. I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience, uh, questions, comments, what questions do you have for the panel? What would you need to see to trust? I don't see whether I distrust it as to how I think I think what I would need to do is take some stuff that I've delivered to a client, run it through the AI version, and kind of compare and just make sure. Because because I don't want to I don't want to release the reins on something that I haven't fully checked myself. I guess when I think about what I deliver to clients, I do a lot of I mean I'll test test it through a couple times. You know? So I document, then I'm going to walk through the documentation and do a full full run through at least a couple times. And if I catch one thing, I'm redoing the whole run through and just to double check. And it's sort of a paranoia thing because I don't want, if my client has to waste time on any one thing, he's the guy or gal that didn't build it, it's going to take them way more time than it would be to quickly find that. So it's, it's, it's a balanced thing. And I guess, you know, as I'm speaking out loud about this, I mean, all this sounds like an extended workflow, right? I mean, you can have multiple grading layers and testing layers built into this. So there's no reason it's not possible. Most of my clients, these range from large institutional investors to small businesses with uh, you know, a handful of people trying to, or the owner just wants to get kind of workflow, way, way too few hours to work with, and way too much to do. It's like, how can I uh, use an AI to solve this? So I'll like, go into the uh, combination of traditional and, and AI tools, you know, try and make it as automated as hands off as possible, and then have the documentation so if anything ever, they ever get it. So when I get asked that question, I came from network automation, network infrastructure automation, and for the past 10 years I've been bombarded with that question. And then falling into the AI space, you know, I hear that question a lot, is when do you trust the AI to do something that you don't review? And my response is always thrown back on the person to tell me when they trust their team to be able to do that without you reviewing. And when you can trust your team to deliver something without it having to be fully reviewed by you as a manager or whatever, those should be the exact same workflows and the exact same testing validation steps that an AI takes. I, I don't necessarily think the AI should be treated any different than you would a human team member. At what point do you trust it? And when you can put qualitative numbers to that for both humans and AI, that also allows you to measure who can do it better. But until then, it is a guessing game, and you have to trust, build some trust on the way. And it's up to you. That's usually how I answer that one. I was paying fingers to know what kind of IDE you use and uh, uh, integration tool. I, I tend to prefer with iChar and the PHP Storm, but when it comes to using the Copilot, the uh, VS Code integration is much better. And so I end up using, like, going back and forth between two IDEs. What kind of ID you use, and has like the use of uh, AI changed which ID you use or which tools you use with like between the like the AI and your own? I use Visual Studio Code in Cloud Dev as a nice little add-in native to that, so it's been a multitude for the last several years. Except the Cloud Dev thing. Yeah, I was pretty much exclusively VS Code. I would try things out just for fun, and I did do like any of the JetBrains IDs so that I would like to ride around during you know styles of .NET development, but, and then PyCharm diving into LangChain and everything else, but now with Claude Dev, like, kind of the bulk VS Code. So yeah, it's definitely changed because of that. And I think Jeff Ranks has their own AI coding system. I don't think it's as good as the other two. I've been a hardcore PyCharm IDEA user for the better part of a decade. I use it quite in depth. Um, I have found, to answer your question, it, the, the AI movement has shifted me over to give um, VS Code more of a chance to see how it is. Um, I feel, in my opinion, that JetBrain PyCharm has not 
it's more clunky to work with, it's not as intuitive, it's not built into the workflows like it should be. And I see that that is better handled by the VS Code team. And then you have tools like Claude Dev that everybody keeps talking about that's VS Code only, that, that makes a big difference there. Um, I do use Copilot, um, the GitHub Copilot, a paid subscription on PyCharm. And I would say half the time I'm developing, um, I have it turned off, um, mostly because of the, the auto-completion functionality gets annoying, especially when I'm editing code. But when I'm writing that new code, I let it run loose. Um, so that's kind of my experience with it. Something's kind of interesting though, because you mentioned earlier about, you know, almost want to just use the most popular frameworks and languages and everything, just so it's familiar with those. I, I have started to wonder if we just kind of converge all the same handful of tools, no matter, yeah, we just keep going down the same routes because, you know, why use anything else if this is where all the tools are, this is where all the people are, this is what the you know, is the best. Yeah, I think there's some stats around how the, uh, the human-generated, you know, content, debugging and stuff online has dropped off since Gen AI, so it's sort of a reinforcement. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. I was thinking about the problem I think, Jackson, that you're saying about having to be super verbose. Or maybe you were talking about as well, Rob, but when you're extra explicit, it should lead to better outcomes. Uh, I definitely went through this experience, I think Colin and I were talking about it last week, where I wanted to get it right on the first prompt, so I took extra time. I actually said, listen, I have a problem, this is like the first thing I wrote in the, the context, it's like, I have this issue, do not start coding it, right? So here, let me describe it first. And then ended it with, do you understand so far? And I think I was working with Claude to the chat. So my question is, are there tactics like, you know, don't start until I say so. Here's four different prompts with four different file attachments so you get the full story before you click go to, Get to increase your chances of getting that like first prompt response to be perfect, um, and then sort of tacked onto that idea or question is: Has anyone experienced like instead of having to explain all the things it might need to know, saying, "Ask me what you think you need to know," because maybe that might be less verbose, where you can just be like, "Yep, no, yep, mm, you decide." Okay, now go. Um, I know that wasn't a question as much as my idea, but I guess that it's. How do you, it's a prompt engineering question, I suppose. Myself, I found the best success by breaking that up. Uh, I'm not attempting to get it right the first first time. Um, so when, when I'm building out the workflow, or the workflows that I've built out for code development, um, I broke it down just like a software engineering team. So going back to my point, treat them, treat them like human employees as well. So you have multiple agents. You, you have a planner agent. You have a PM agent. You have a software developer agent. You have a tester agent, a dev agent, whatever. And when the initial question comes in, when you ask your initial question, the, the planner agent takes it and breaks it down into chunks, and this is how we want to organize it, this is how we want to break it down. Has the, the, the developer actually put some code together? If it doesn't work or they can't put it together that way, circle back up to the PM and say, yeah, we can't do that, give me another option. And so instead of taking a one-shot approach, you break it down into a workflow that allows it to repeat itself until it finds the right solution. That's how I approach that. I, I use a tool called, well, it's a website, cursor.directory, which is just a list of like pretext contexts. It'll be like, you are an expert level engineer, front engineer, you know, you and Next.js and whatever, and I just use that, and then I write my context. And if there are technologies that I'm using that aren't there, I'll go to my find Python one and go into ChatGPT and be like, I have this context, but I want to do it with other technologies, rewrite it for me. And then I have another one. And I fix that. And um, I have some it's like question. I have seen people tell the prompt to like ask questions and um, like obtain consensus before moving on. I don't do that as much, but like that's a good question to ask and ask people to do that. Another thing to, to pinpoint in on, on one specific response is to actually give it positive and negative examples. So examples actually help AI engines a lot or LLMs, so that's a good way to go about it. Problem is, is if you're talking more complex stuff, like larger bits of code, you know, you can start, you need to start being considerate of your context window. So uh, I want to keep this conversation going. Uh, I do want to make sure we can get Sora on and show his perplexity clone. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for 
for sharing your insights, for sharing knowledge, and continue the conversation. So, uh, yeah, he's on Discord. I'm going to try to get him in, and uh, this is a grand experiment here. So bear with us. Thank you so much for showing up and be part of the community. Thank you.